Can you hear me? Okay, well, it's a problem if you can for the next 60 minutes. Is that? Okay, there we are. Okay, so there's an old tradition, you know, between the Franciscans and the Dominicans that for the feast of St. Dominic, we invite a Franciscan to come and preach to us, and he comes and preaches on St. Francis. It happens every single time. But on the feast of St. Francis, they invite a professional, and a Dominican comes, and <laughs> the order of preachers. So I'm very pleased with this uh, ecumenical invitation to, to speak here at Franciscan University. I'm, I'm even more pleased that they put me in the circus tent. So I, I was supposed to be in the field house, so this is your, your last warning if uh, you came for a trapeze act uh, or at least an elephant uh, on a ball or something like that. I, I, I haven't prepared anything of the sort. Um, so uh, you're coming here today to this tent is an act of faith, and uh, you're staying till the end of my talk will be an act of charity. <laughs> But uh, we have open doors on all sides, so, so feel free to take a breath of air far, far away if you need to. Um, Solomon, the wise man, says that there is a way that seems good to man, but its end is death. There are five types of fool uh, in the book of Proverbs. And what type of a fool would choose the way that leads to death? Um, well, this is, this is why you disguise uh, the way that leads to death as a way that uh, leads to life. It's uh, a way that looks good. Well, what type of a fool um, follows the road that leads to death? Well, examine yourselves and ask why you're sitting here in front of me right now. <laughs> Sirach 27, 4. Uh, when a sieve is shaken, the refuse appears. So do a man's faults when he speaks. So... <laughs> Or in Mark Twain's aphoristic version, better to keep your mouth silent and appear like an idiot than to open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> Which would make a very good Episcopal motto. When, when I am made a bishop, I will choose Acts 26, 24, Festus words to St. Paul. Uh, your great learning is driving you mad. Okay. So St. James tells us, be quick to hear and slow to speak. So now it is my job to speak and your job to listen. And I ask you not to finish your job before I finish mine. Um, that's all the extended uh, captatio benevolentiae, um, which I capture your uh, goodwill. And now I will squander it uh, for the rest of our time together. But uh, as we get serious here a little bit, um, I want to maybe review some of these ideas that have been uh, laid on the table. It's good to let them uh, sink in because uh, you get hit with a lot when you come to one of these conferences. So um, I want to do a little rapid review um, of this notion of, uh, of wisdom literature. And uh, we heard a little bit about this from Dr. Hahn. So uh, he spoke about wisdom literature and these three books of Solomon, which are kind of a, a curriculum uh, in wisdom. Uh, and you start with the book of Proverbs, which is, this is Ben Franklin wisdom, okay? This is the Farmer's Almanac. Um, it's aphoristic kind of wisdom. Uh, this rudimentary uh, moral training that we go through in which uh, the character, the virtues are built. He connected this with this first stage in the spiritual life. Uh, which is the purgative way. Uh, then there's another type of wisdom, uh, the this, this second book, which is uh, in the three-volume Corpus of Solomon, is the book of Kohelet. Ah, I, I forgot to mention, one, one of your penances here is they, they don't, in fact, have that magic timer in front of me. Okay, so this, this may end very quickly and mercifully or uh, be unending. Okay, so someone needs to give me signals. Ah, the other thing about this. Ah. Is this? You'll stand here? Okay, good. I have a companion. So, um, do you have a watch? Can we, can we talk? Does anyone here have a watch? Okay, someone, okay, we're, we'll, we'll do the best we can. How about you? You have a watch? No, you have a watch? You have a watch? Okay, thank you. We'll just, see, we're professionals here.
Okay, that's for your sake. So um, the second book uh, of wisdom or type of wisdom, we're, we're really talking about types of wisdom because uh, the Protestants um, think they like the Bible, but um, the Catholics have even more Bible than the Protestants, and we have even more wisdom books than the Protestants, okay? And we have um, not just Proverbs, but the book of Sirach, which is a kind of development. It's, it's a reflection on the book of Proverbs. It's centuries later, we have uh, another scribe um, transforming uh, these same types of wisdom uh, and uh, giving us another type of aphoristic proverbial wisdom. Then the, the, the second genre, okay, literary genre of uh, wisdom uh, is the book of Kohelet uh, or Ecclesiastes, okay? And this is, this is the, the point when you start to ask critical questions, okay? And the world uh, doesn't look so simple as it does um, with these, these little proverbs that, that our, our mother and father taught us that, that we hang on to, but you start to have a kind of critical questioning um, spirit. And the book of Job is also uh, associated with this, this type of reflection. Is the world really that simple that um, if you do good, good things will happen to you, okay? Um, no, um, there's a problem of innocent suffering, okay? Um, it, we start to uh, mature a little bit and uh, ask why, why is the world so inscrutable, okay? Why is wisdom so inscrutable? And then this uh, third, this pinnacle uh, of wisdom is uh, we heard beautifully today, and if anywhere was at the, uh, um, the, uh, the dazzling talk of, uh, of Dr. Herrmann. Um, the, the Song of Songs is the, the unitive way in which uh, we pass into a kind of love uh, relationship uh, with God. We pass beyond this, uh, this struggle and this suffering. Another thing that's, that's just kind of a global uh, view, and this, this is meant to be a workshop, I'm told. Uh, I said that uh, Dominicans have a uh, habitual uh, and perverse predilection uh, for being useless, um, and in, in the high sense of, uh, of doing things as an end in themselves, but we'll try to, try to be useful here and run this as a workshop. So I'm going to talk about testing, okay, and discipline. As, uh, and trial as a way to wisdom. So I'll make this uh, entire hour a trial for you, okay? So that we'll all emerge on the other side uh, a little bit wiser. Uh, Solomon uh, himself gives us these different varieties of wisdom, and St. Paul has a beautiful line in the letter to the Ephesians in which uh, he coins a term. It doesn't exist in Greek until he writes it. Uh, uh, polypoikolos, okay, um, the multi-manifold uh, shape of wisdom. Um, there's this variety to wisdom which can't be reduced to a single type, okay, a, symbol, a, symbol, a single um, manner of thinking or engaging with the world. It's rich in the same way that we uh, have all of these books uh, that show us different types of wisdom. Another point, and this is, this is just to review and to put it into uh, perspective, uh, what we're going to go, is um, we made a distinction uh, last night, uh, Dr. Han did, between the gift of wisdom and the virtue of wisdom. This is, this is an important distinction. It's a very important distinction because it has everything to do with wisdom from above, which is the title I took here um, from the letter of St. James. The wisdom from above is the gift of wisdom, which is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, there's a human wisdom, which is something cultivated in the intellect by philosophers, but also by the Ben Franklins of the world, a kind of uh, more uh, homespun type of wisdom. Um, the, the gift and the virtue uh, are distinguished between human effort um, and something that is given by God. St. Thomas uh, Aquinas gives a magnificent image um, between a boat where you row um, by your own power and a boat that is blown by the wind, a sailboat. And this is the difference between wisdom that comes from above. Um, it's, it's the breath of the Holy Spirit that moves us. So um, we can struggle along uh, in our little rowboats trying to understand the world, trying to penetrate the world, and we can sharpen our minds in different ways, and we can ask questions like philosophers ask, as you do when you take philosophy classes uh, in your uh, college. Or um, uh, this, this can only get us so far. It can only get us as far um, as our own native powers, okay? Um, when the breath of God begins to move us, we begin to move uh, fast and far. Um, God can act in a way that's proportionate to his own power. This is the remarkable thing. Uh, and this is why saints um, are no longer simply 
having an effect in a little time and place, but can reach out and touch the whole universal church. And not just, uh, not just the uh, universal church uh, in the time when they live, but pass through the centuries. Okay, This is someone being moved by God, proportionate to God uh, and to his spirit that permeates all things. So there's a, a progression in the spiritual life that takes us um, from these virtues that we acquire by sweat, okay, by hard work, by study, okay, but that have a threshold. Um, and this crowning gift... And each of the seven virtues um, is crowned by um, a particular gift. So there's a relationship between the four cardinal virtues and the three theological virtues and these seven gifts of the Spirit, okay, um, in which God's Spirit comes uh, within our human spirit and expands uh, that strength, those muscles that we've built up uh, by our own uh, exercise and gives us an agency um, adequate to his own plan. Okay, we're tiny little things, we're hobbits, okay? We can't do a whole lot on our own, and we can't understand a whole lot on our own, which is actually very consoling, um, that there's a wisdom deeper um, than, the, uh, than, than the tiny imagination of our own minds, okay? So understanding um, the, the dimensions, the height and the depth um, of this uh, gift of wisdom uh, is what brings us to the supernatural level. When we start to do supernatural things, okay, so we start to do things that um, exceed the comprehension of a human mind. So this, for instance, in the gift of counsel, which is closely related to the gift of wisdom, the gift of counsel uh, perfects the virtue of prudence by which I, I govern my actions, okay? I, I, um, I'm a politician, I, I try to be prudent, I, I weigh the, um, uh, the, the different possibilities, and I determine this is the most circumspect um, and, uh, and promising path to follow. Uh, the, the gift of counsel makes us do stupid things, okay, that are wise uh, in the eyes of God. There's a famous story of, uh, of St. Dominic when he's founding uh, the Dominican order, that uh, when he only had a handful of brothers um, and uh, the order wasn't founded at all, he sent them out to the four corners of the world, okay? And all of his brothers told him, this is a stupid idea. You need to consolidate and, and build a firm foundation. What he's doing here is he's acting uh, according to a higher gift of counsel, which is to say he's attuned to the providence of God. He does things that will succeed because he is in harmony with this divine plan, in an intuitive way. It's, it's a kind of um, supernatural animal instinct, okay? Animals do things um, that are uh, uh, proper uh, to the plan for their prosperity. In the same way, when these gifts infuse us, we act in ways that, that, that grease the, the machinery of God's providence. And this is what happens uh, when the gift of wisdom uh, enters into us. And there's two types of knowledge um, two types of wisdom, two ways uh, of knowing things, okay? Not just these, these levels, okay? The, the, the agency is proportionate to my own human, uh, to my own human will and strength. Um, there's, there's also a, a difference between uh, that knowledge uh, which is known by cognition, okay? By thinking, by reason, and that which is known um, by connaturality, because I share um, an innate sympathy Okay, a relationship with something. Uh, so the, the distinction is between a moral philosopher um, who can speak about uh, the, the virtues of chastity, for instance, and what's the right thing to do in this or that situation, and asking someone who's chaste. Okay, this is, this is the lived wisdom uh, of uh, connaturality that's, that's been incarnated somehow. Okay, so this, this movement towards a connatural wisdom uh, is also part of the gift of wisdom, that it's, uh, that it's no longer at the level of reflection, okay? It's not a theory, but it's something that has inhabited me so that I instinctively choose the good. How do you know what the good is? You watch the good man, okay? The man who, who instinctively, like a virtuoso, does the right thing. So doing the good, living the good life, is like learning an instrument, okay? Um, we, we, we train our fingers, we, we play intervals over and over until it's connatural, it's part of us, it becomes a second nature, and then the second nature carries us. And then, uh, when the Holy Spirit begins to blow within us, okay, then we begin to perform with a virtuosity uh, which is proper to God. So, um, these 
capacities um, of, uh, of, of human understanding, uh, these capacities for practical uh, intelligence, are about the direction of human acts. So wisdom is, is about directing human action. It's about directing our lives. It's about directing the world. And the wisdom of God uh, is that which, in a practical way, like a, a good uh, politician, orders the affairs of men, orders the affairs of the world uh, in a sweet way, with a sweet disposition. So there are degrees uh, of this practical intelligence. There's this moral philosophy. Um, there's uh, the, the intermediate uh, practical knowledge. And, and there's this level of prudence, the, 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 the level of the one who's imbibed the virtues. And this is the difference between, to give you an example, um, a chemist who thinks about uh, the structure of the world um, and thinks about um, elements and uh, compound reactions and a biologist. And then researchers at a drug company uh, who start to ask, well, how can we combine these things in a useful way, okay, to, to uh, cure cancer, to, to um, cure some disease, okay? That's, that's like moral philosophy, when we start to have a practical application of this purely speculative knowledge, but now it's ordered to something, okay? But this is completely different than the doctor uh, who knows how to recognize the problem and prescribe the right drug, okay? And so when we descend down to this level, Okay, uh, and it's no longer pure speculation, and it's no longer speculation ordered towards the practical, but it's the actual diagnosis of a situation. Okay, this is the medicine. Okay, this is when wisdom uh, has descended into our hearts. This is when uh, the gift has um, begun to become the motor uh, and the animating force of all our actions. Okay, when we recognize what the medicine of God's wisdom uh, has prescribed. So, um, there are degrees of wisdom then, uh, and everyone, uh, by their baptism, has been given this gift. Everyone has this. You all have this. Um, it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, spiritual GPS uh, that leads you on the right path. I said there's uh, a way that leads to, um, th that looks good to man, that leads to death. Okay, what kind of a fool chooses that path? Moses, Moses stands up and he says, I lay before you today um, life and death, a blessing and a curse. This in the wisdom literature is called the two ways. The world is very, very simple uh, in the vision of biblical wisdom. There are, it's black and white. There are two ways. Okay, there's the way that leads to life and the way that leads to death. So why does it get confusing? Why do we have to have a book like, um, like Ecclesiastes or Job? Because no fool will choose the way that leads to death, unless it looks like the way that leads to life. And conversely, the way that leads to life has been disguised by those who wish to lead us down the way of death as the way of death. Okay, and, and this is why the wisdom of the Beatitudes, which turns on its head the wisdom of the world, tells us to rejoice in suffering. It tells us to rejoice in suffering, okay? And this is the joy of the cross. This is the medicine of the cross uh, that, uh, uh, that Dr. Shree spoke about this morning. Uh, so to have the eyes to penetrate uh, beyond this, um, uh, this disguise, um, which would divert us down uh, one way or the other, uh, this is the gift of every Christian, okay, this mystical gift. Um, it comes with sanctifying grace. But there is a further gift of wisdom, okay, which is what we call uh, a gift given freely, a gratia gratis data, okay, which are, these are the, the charismatic gifts of the Spirit. And there's a still higher wisdom that has been granted on top of that which allows us not simply to organize and order my life so that I follow the way to life, but which allows me uh, to diffuse wisdom in the world, okay? Uh, to, to clear the eyes of those around us, those who um, uh, d deceived uh, by the way of death are plotting on what they think is the way to life. This gift of wisdom, which opens the eyes of others, uh, is a gift that God gives to his church, gives to special individuals uh, in his church, to lead all men to salvation. So, 
this is the gift of wisdom. This is the wisdom literature. This is the way that the, uh, the gifts uh, of the Spirit uh, work within our lives. And so what I want to talk about is this way of life that looks like the way of death, okay? Uh, trial, testing, and in particular, uh, testing in prayer. So I don't know if you have yet received uh, your July issue of the Harvard Review of Psychiatry, <laughs> okay? Uh, but if you have, you've seen um, a ridiculous article entitled uh, The Emerging Empirical Science of Wisdom, Neurobiology, Longevity, and Intervention. Now, this is very interesting. Um, the, uh, the, um, the, the psychiatric establishment um, has created um, a research sector that is pursuing wisdom. This is not a bad thing in itself. Um, at the University of Chicago, there is a, an enormous center for practical wisdom. Um, in this uh, article on the emerging empirical science uh, of wisdom, we are informed about the neurocircuitry of wisdom. Okay, so uh, we've attempted to quantify wisdom, okay, to, to name all of the characteristics of wisdom and the parts of the brain that fire when people are wise. Now, this is an interesting project. Um, what, they, what they've done is, is read the great wisdom traditions of the world. Okay, so there's um, this kind of secular dimension, as I said, to the, to the intellectual um, virtue of wisdom. We have philosophers and we have human natural religions. Okay, so they read the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, uh, they, they read the Quran, they read the wisdom literature, and they, they asked themselves what are the, the traits, the characteristics um, of wisdom? And then they did surveys um, about people who they think they're wise, and they came up with five, uh, five qualities that cluster uh, around uh, this characteristic, this possession of wisdom. One has pro-social behaviors, okay, which is to say you're not uh, asocial, you're somehow um, well integrated into society, um, perhaps even uh, a leader uh, of some sort. One is gifted with self-reflection. There is uh, an acceptance of uncertainty. Uh, there is decisiveness which sounds like um, a lack of acceptance of uncertainty, but nevertheless, there's this, um, this uh, ability to be decisive and also to live with uncertainty. And there is uh, a very um, amorphous uh, notion called spirituality. Okay, so these, these are the characteristics. Um, and then they ask, well, how, how can we get people uh, to, to imbibe these qualities, uh, to manifest these qualities in their life? And uh, they offer uh, a series of wisdom-related interventions, okay? So this is how we're going to acquire wisdom, um, is uh, we're going to go to a series of camps, okay? This is, this is what they propose, so here you're at wisdom camp. Okay, you, this is what you signed up for. And hopefully it does something. Hopefully when we, we reflect on these texts that uh, we do imbibe something. Okay, um, they suggest, go figure, um, psychiatric counseling. Okay, so, so the industry uh, has, has, uh, has affirmed uh, its own utility for the world. Okay, there's something uh, in this whole project uh, appropriate and also incongruously irrelevant, okay, uh, in the empirical uh, approach. Uh, to, to search for this is, is like searching for the soul, okay, with, uh, with a flashlight or a shovel, okay? Um, we're, we're, we're trying to, to render palpable and put under a microscope uh, something that's much more mysterious. Nevertheless, uh, there is um, something wise uh, in this effort um, of the uh, psychiatric establishment, um, and it's a question that uh, begins the wisdom tradition. Where is wisdom to be found? So uh, in the 28th chapter of Job, um, in all of these uh, cycles of speeches that, that Job's um, unhelpful friends uh, uh, foist upon him, uh, we hear this, this magnificent poem. There is indeed a mine for silver and a place for gold which men refine. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is melted out of stone. 
The earth, though out of it comes forth bread, is in fiery upheaval underneath. Its stones are the source of sapphires, and there is gold in its dust. But whence can wisdom be attained? And where is the place of understanding? Man knows nothing to equal it, nor is it to be had in the land of the living. The, the poem goes on. Um, this question, where is wisdom to be found? Surely there is a mine for silver. We're digging in the depths of the earth, uh, and we can find these riches. We can find these riches that are uh, hidden in the very bosom of creation. But where is wisdom to be found? Uh, the, the digging for wisdom uh, can be a, a digging beneath uh, the personal order. Okay? Uh, we, we heard something very important uh, uh, in several of these talks, um, that wisdom is personal. Okay, the, the type of knowledge uh, that we're seeking is personal, uh, which is to say, we want a synthesis uh, of all the wisdom, of all the mathematics, okay, of all the truth that we can know, of all the science that we can know, of all the um, psychological reflection, and yet this higher wisdom that comes down from above. And where is the synthesis uh, of all of this? Uh, it's met in someone uh, whose mind, okay, whose person is filled with all of this wisdom who pours forth this wisdom, in whose presence we experience this wisdom. We're searching for a person, okay? But we can search beneath the personal level, which is to say we can search under a microscope, we can search uh, in the earth, we can search in biology, we can search in chemistry, okay? We can dig into these sub-personal places uh, trying to find wisdom to understand how does the world work? Um, so, in the chemical, in the biological, in the psychological still, or the sociological, and try to, to, to find the laws that govern all things. We're searching for a, a wisdom that is imminent to the world, to the created order. Uh, what we're searching for is a law. This is, this is what uh, the chemists are searching for. This is what the mathematicians, the physicists are searching for. We want a law. Okay, we want something that explains, um, that, that in a formula uh, renders intelligible the, the, the mysteries that we see around us. Why, why do things fall? Why do apples fall uh, off of trees? Why do strange things happen? Okay, we're, we're seeking to penetrate that uh, and to find the law. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, in a famous book uh, that, that you probably know, uh, a great book, The Abolition of Man, uh, speaks of the Tao. Okay, this is the natural law, this kind of common possession of all religions okay, that have been seeking for order um, at all levels. Okay, also a moral order. Why do things happen in the moral order uh, the way that they do? Uh, the moral laws uh, that we discover, um, that if you do bad things, then uh, there will be consequences. Okay, so um, I had a little niece who was allowed to run out in the snow in her shorts, okay? Why? So that she'll learn a lesson, okay? This is what we do. This is how you train people in wisdom, okay? You let them learn a lesson because there are consequences, okay? There are often consequences, but sometimes there aren't. Um, Psalm 73 um, is a magnificent reflection um, on, uh, on the fact that all the wicked seem to prosper. It seems like they get away with it, okay? Look around. Okay, um, we, we had another nice reflection on, uh, on the church as, as the corpse of the body of Christ or something. Why, why is the world flourishing and why are the churches empty? Why, why are things the way they are? Okay, there's a mystery here uh, and we're searching uh, for the law. This question, where is wisdom to be found, becomes a topos. It becomes a motif, a theme that recurs through the wisdom literature. Uh, it shows up again in the book of Baruch uh, in chapter 3 uh, in another uh, wonderful poem. Um, and here uh, we get an answer to this question. It's not just a question that's posed, where is wisdom to be found? Um, we're given an answer. Um, don't dig uh, in the depths of the earth. The law that you're seeking is the law, uh, the Torah of God. This is the wisdom. Uh, this is the place um, in which the, um, the synthesis, um, the order, uh, the, the laws by which all things are governed uh, can be discovered. This is uh, the same theme that we find in the book of Sirach. Um, it's an exclusive law, however. 
Uh, it's a law that's not given to everyone, okay? So just as um, only uh, high-powered physicists can understand uh, the, the equations that give them uh, access to the physical laws of the universe, the, the, the laws uh, of God are only given to his people. They're only given to his people, and uh, Baruch actually talks about the way that the sons of Ishmael don't have the law, okay? Uh, they're lost in ignorance, Okay, so this possession of the law isn't a universal possession, okay? It's an exclusive possession. Um, it's a gift. It's a gift that's uh, been given. And it's a gift that's been given, which is to say, um, in this chapter, uh, the third chapter of Baruch, uh, it's no longer we who are searching wisdom, uh, but it's wisdom who finds us. Wisdom comes and finds us because we're lost, we're searching for the way. We don't know whether this is the right way or not. And in this way, the law is handed to us uh, as a roadmap, okay, um, as, as a way to follow. Wisdom finds us um, because wisdom becomes incarnate. Wisdom has to take on flesh uh, in Jerusalem, in Israel, and ultimately uh, in the flesh of Christ. Now, if wisdom uh, is given to us, there's no need to pray for it. There's no need to pray uh, for the gift of the law. It's already there. It's, it's, in, it's in the Bible. Um, and so we, we have this verse that uh, Dr. Hahn mentioned um, in the letter to James. Pray for wisdom, okay? Um, if any of you are lacking wisdom, pray for it, and it shall surely be given. We're commanded to pray for wisdom, and yet wisdom is in our hands. Now, it's very, very interesting um, that this, this effort to acquire wisdom through, through study, through searching, okay, which incidentally is the word midrash, okay, so the, 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 the word to search for wisdom uh, is the word for interpretation of the Bible, midrash uh, in Judaism. We're searching, um, and yet uh, we don't have to pray, and there's no tradition of prayer uh, for wisdom in the Old Testament. This is very, very strange, except the prayer of Solomon. There's only one prayer of wisdom uh, in the Old Testament, um, and this is in 1 Kings 3. Solomon, um, in this nighttime vigil, as we, as we heard, when he makes this uh, massive sacrifice, um, prays for this gift of wisdom. There's something very strange about this prayer. What do you notice about this prayer? How does the prayer start? God starts the prayer. What does God do to, to set Solomon going? He asks a question. Solomon is responding to a question. And what does God ask him? He asks him to ask him something. God, God shows up as a genie in a bottle. And, and he says to Solomon, ask whatever you wish. This is how the prayer to wisdom uh, makes its appearance in the Bible, is, is uh, the divine genie uh, appears uh, and offers to Solomon anything that he wishes. Now, what does this make uh, of prayer and prayer for wisdom uh, from the very beginning? It's a test. It's a test of Solomon. It's a test of Solomon. This we see uh, in the very character uh, of the prayer, okay? What can he ask for? Well, there's anything in the world. Um, there's a number of saints who have, who have passed this test, okay? St. Saint, uh, Thomas Aquinas, famously, uh, on the Feast of St. Nicholas, the, the cross uh, started to speak to him, like the cross spoke to St. To Francis. And he said, you have written well of me, Thomas. What do you wish? Okay, this is a scary thing. If God says, what do you wish? You better get this right. Okay? And what did St. Thomas say? Nisi, uh, uh, nisi non te domine. Nothing if not you, Lord. Okay? He passed. He's a good student, St. Thomas. No, no, no surprise here. Okay? There's other students who got it wrong. Okay? Um, St. Gertrude got the same test. Um, ask what you wish, Gertrude. What did she ask for? That she could read Latin better. Okay? <laughs> That's a dumb response. And she, she, she had buyer's remorse and then backed up and said, you, Lord. Okay? 
This is the danger, and this is the danger, in fact, um, uh, of every such test um, when Ahaz, okay, the wicked king in the fourth age of the world, is asked to ask for a sign. Okay, what does he do? Well, thank goodness he doesn't ask for a sign, because if he did, he would have asked for something stupid, the sun to spin, okay? But he wouldn't have asked um, for uh, the incarnate Lord to be born of a virgin, this is the wisdom of God, okay, um, which, uh, which has answered its own test, okay? Ask for a sign. Ask for what you will. Uh, the Lord comes to Solomon and puts him to the test. This is, uh, this is very like what uh, I, I had a Korean friend uh, when I was in high school um, who told me that when a Korean child is born, they, they lay three things uh, in front of the infant. There are other, other cultures who do something similar. They, they put a pencil and a noodle and a coin, okay? Um, and the child is meant to reach for one, and this will be its destiny, okay? So if you choose the coin, you will be rich. If you choose uh, the, the, the pencil, you will be intelligent. And if you choose the noodle, you will like pasta, You'll be wise. Why, why the noodle is, is the symbol of, uh, of wisdom, I do not know. Uh, he chose a, a roll of paper towels, uh, as a matter of fact, and uh, what that means, uh, I also do not know. The, the Lord puts us to a test. Um, the Lord puts us to a test uh, in the very act of prayer. Now, have you ever been asked this? Okay, have you, have you stumbled upon the, the, the genie bottle? Well, it's, as a matter of fact, you have. As a matter of fact, you have. Um, how does the Lord uh, present uh, the, the, the task of praying in the Christian life? What does he say in the Gospel of John? Ask anything in my name and you shall have it. Prayer itself is a test. Uh, what we ask for is a test. It's a test that's given to us. Now, Solomon is tested, okay? Solomon is put to the test. Will he grab the noodle? Will we grab the noodle when Jesus offers to us infallible prayer? This is an incredible gift. Jesus has offered to us the gift of infallible prayer. Ask for whatever you wish in my name, and you will receive it. Um, I, I don't know um, if there are other saints uh, in the history of the church that have had this charism, but St. Dominic um, once uh, confessed to a um, Cistercian that he had never asked for anything in prayer that he was not granted. And then he, he told him to, to hush this up until he died, but then word got out. This is extraordinary. He had never asked for anything in prayer that was denied. Now, what can this possibly mean? How can we render our prayer infallible when our prayer is perfectly attuned to the mind of God, when our prayer is perfectly attuned to the wisdom that disposes all things sweetly, when our prayer is perfectly animated by charity, our prayer is infallible. Our prayer becomes the very expression of God's wisdom in the world. This is the test that we're put to in prayer, uh, is to conform ourselves so perfectly to this ordering of all things that we become agents of God's wisdom in the world. Uh, Solomon is put to the test, and he's already given the ability to answer. He's given the wisdom to choose wisdom. The wisdom itself is given to him uh, to, to grab for the noodle and not the, uh, not the, not the paper towels, okay? Solomon has a monopoly in the Old Testament on prayers for wisdom. I said, we don't have prayers for wisdom. There's lots and lots of prayers in the Old Testament, okay? Make no mistake, there's a whole book of it, okay, um, in, the, uh, uh, in the book of Psalms. But you won't find these prayers for wisdom, to ask specifically for wisdom. Um, Solomon has a monopoly on prayer, and we start to develop these prayers of Solomon. So the prayer uh, of this story in uh, 1 Kings 3 um, becomes uh, an entire tradition in itself as Israel reflects and thinks about this more and more. And we get a beautiful, it's, it's, it's compact when Solomon chooses wisdom. And in choosing wisdom, of course, he passes the test because uh, like the one who chooses first the kingdom of God, all things are given to him besides. But in this compact little narrative, uh, we don't hear the prayer itself. Um, in the book of the wisdom of Solomon, 
um, in chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9, uh, we get a magnificent expansion of what this prayer actually is. And in chapter 9 itself, um, we get a magnificent uh, poetic rendering of the prayer of Solomon for wisdom. Okay, this, this prayer uh, belongs uniquely to Solomon. This prayer for wisdom um, belongs uniquely to the king. This is important to understand. Again, if you were um, at, uh, at Dr. Harriman's talk, you, you, you heard a little bit about this relationship uh, between the king and wisdom. Okay, wisdom belongs to God. And in the ancient world, um, it, it was unique to the king uh, to be the possessor of wisdom because it belonged to the king to order the world like a god. Okay, which is why we reserve this prayer for wisdom only to the king. Okay, there's only one who can have this dignity to order all things like God on earth. And the, the prayer for wisdom, in fact, in the book of wisdom, is ordered to the signal act, the most important act of Solomon. Okay, what's the most important thing that Solomon does? He builds the temple. What does this mean in the ancient world? Uh, the, the temple is that which instantiates and incarnates and makes present God's presence, which is to say his wisdom, his prosperity, and his order in the chaos of the world. Okay, so you make a home for God, and to do this, you require wisdom. To build a place where God can dwell uh, within the chaos of the world requires wisdom. So this is why the builders that Solomon uh, has to incorporate are given the gift of wisdom. Hiram from Tyre, like Bezalel, who built the tabernacle, uh, is filled with a spirit uh, of wisdom and understanding and knowledge in all manner of workmanship. How can we possibly bring God down into the world? It's uniquely the task of the king in the ancient uh, world. Uh, which is leading us uh, towards that messianic king who will more perfectly render a temple, okay, and a wisdom in the world. Uh, but it belongs uniquely to uh, the royal dignity uh, to ask for wisdom, which in fact is why um, in the book of Sirach, in chapter 51, we have another prayer. The book of Sirach ends with a, a, a wonderful prayer. And in the Hebrew text, uh, it says, before I traveled much, I cried out for wisdom. Okay, but in the Greek text, um, this figure has been changed. It's no longer I who traveled much. It's before he, Solomon, traveled much. He cried out for wisdom. Um, it, which is to say, the, the translators of the Greek Bible um, were so convinced that only the king could utter this prayer that they had to change the text. Okay, uh, because this dignity of bringing wisdom into the world uh, is... Uh, uniquely the gift of the king. Now, Jesus never prays for wisdom. Jesus utters no prayer uh, for wisdom. He doesn't cry out for wisdom. Uh, he's not put to the test. He rather puts us to the test because there is something greater than Solomon here. Jesus calls out like wisdom uh, in the words uh, of wisdom. So, uh, Solomon's prayer in uh, chapter 9 of the Book of Wisdom is a response to the word of wisdom. So just as in 1 Kings 3, uh, God initiates the prayer and Solomon responds to the test, so in the Book of Wisdom, uh, wisdom itself first speaks a word, uh, which elicits the prayer of Solomon. And this is the same way um, and the same words uh, which wisdom speaks in the book of wisdom are in the mouth of Jesus when he says, come to me, all you who labor, okay, and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon your shoulders and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. This is a reference to this call of wisdom, uh, which appears both uh, in the book of wisdom and in Sirach. This is the call uh, which is meant uh, to elicit uh, this response of wisdom for us. Jesus doesn't pray for wisdom, but he teaches us how to pray. He teaches us uh, how to pray um, by teaching us uh, this prayer of the Our Father. Uh, this turn to the Father, okay, uh, this turn to the Father uh, is what leads us uh, ultimately to this question of uh, the prayer as a test, as a discipline. What is the role of the father uh, in wisdom literature? Okay, he's, he's the one who disciplines, who chastises his child. 
Prayer is a test, okay? Prayer is a test that um, is put to us by the Father. Why is prayer a test? Well, prayer is difficult. You've wondered um, why after you committed some ridiculous mortal sin, okay, I, um, I, Father, I'm, I'm guilty of sabotage, I, I don't know, you, you confess something and then you get three Hail Marys, okay, no matter what you've done. <laughs> why, why do you always get prayer uh, as your penance? Because prayer is hard. Prayer is very, very hard. Prayer is a test of what we are. And what are we? I'll tell you what we are. We are spiritual whales. Okay, the whale is a funny animal. It's, it's a giant bulk of blubber, okay, that's floating in the ocean, uh, but breathes the air above. But breathes the air above. It's an animal. It's, it's a sea mammal. Okay, this is what we are. We're rational animals, okay? We're, we're, we're animals. We scratch ourselves. We make funny noises, okay? We grow hair in funny places. We're animals, but we're rational animals, and we breathe the air above. We breathe this air of the angels, but we're weighted down by this blubber of the flesh, which, which heaves upon us, okay, with a force and a gravity that makes it hard to mount to the skies above. And we can grasp for a breath, a breath okay, um, and reach for this air, which is um, the, the Empyrean uh, angelic heavens, but then we sink back down again, okay? Uh, the, the test of prayer is a test uh, to live on a supernatural food, there's something very, very interesting. Uh, we just had this, uh, this gospel yes, uh, the day before yesterday, um, the, the, the gift of the manna. Uh, the gift of the manna uh, is, uh, is, is a supernatural food. The, the, the Israelites are grumbling because they're hungry. Uh, they want the flesh pots uh, of Egypt. And so what does God send them? Okay. He sends them something they can't understand at all. The word manna uh, is, in fact, just the Hebrew word for the question that they pose. What is this? Okay, this is often what I pose. I, I live in Israel where we have Polish sisters cooking uh, Palestinian food for Frenchmen. Okay? <laughs> and when I go to dinner, I say, what is this? Okay, this is, this is what the Israelites say. They say, what is this? This is the manna. But this is a very mysterious thing that God does. He responds to the hungers of these people by giving something that doesn't correspond to their hungers. It's not the flesh pots of Egypt, okay? And it's not the bread that they knew there. He feeds them on a supernatural, with supernatural food, okay? This, this is as though, okay, we are these dogs um, at the, the foot of the table, Okay, we just, we don't know the difference between dog chow and trout wellington, okay? Some magnificent meal, okay? Um, God raises us up and feeds us with something that's supernatural to elevate our appetites. And this is what it is, okay? This elevation of our appetites, but in a way we can't understand. And, and this is the way that the Father tests us. Eat this. It's good for you. Okay, this is the way that we uh, test our children. You don't understand this. Okay, simply follow me and trust me. And he puts his children to the test. He puts his children to the test to accept a wisdom that they can't attain, that's beyond them. Okay, it's a meal prepared with a love, okay, with a meaning, um, with, with a delicacy that they can't appreciate, but it's good for them. Okay, and he gives it to them, and it's the test that they shall eat it. Okay, this is a wisdom uh, to live that which um, leaves us only with questions. This is the magnificent um, moment in the book of Job, is that um, God's questions are more satisfying uh, than Job's answers. Uh, God gives questions. He leaves us with questions, and in this way, we're opened uh, to follow his wisdom. So uh, God puts us to the test. He puts us to the test in our own person. Uh, because we're forced uh, to live in a way beyond our own powers, okay? To live on his own wisdom, which is a wisdom higher than we are. Uh, he puts us uh, to the test um, by distractions, okay? This is something that we all experience in prayer, okay? Our mind is everywhere else, okay? It's everywhere else but, but on God, okay? This is, the, this is the law of spiritual blubber, Okay, which is pulling us back down. It's very difficult uh, to think these rarefied thoughts. Now, uh, one of the tests of prayer um, is the temptation to judge our prayer by our experience of prayer. 
okay? And to judge the quality of my prayer based on uh, what I sensibly feel, okay? That was a good prayer hour, okay? I was, uh, I was uh, somehow deeply engaged with God. The exclusive judge of our prayer um, is not found in our experience of prayer. It's not found in our prayer hour. It's found in the growth in charity, okay? The quality of our prayer is measured by the growth of charity in our life. This is why I said um, this gift of uh, infallible prayer, uh, this gift of infallible prayer is that moment when uh, we have been perfectly moved by charity. So when God is moving us more and more to charity and we see in these other dimensions of our life uh, that we're growing in charity, then our prayer is good. Okay, then our prayer is good, even though it's dry in the same way that, um, in fact, the Israelites started to complain about this manna, but it's good for them. Okay, I, I always blamed the Israelites uh, for complaining about manna until I went to um, Moshi's famous falafel uh, on 54th and Lexington. Okay, and if manna tasted anything like this, they had every reason to complain. Okay, so they, they, they complain, but it's good for them uh, because it gets them where they're going. Okay, um, and this is the same way with us. God is moving us uh, to charity. He's testing us uh, to bring us to charity. And this, this um, in fact, is very interesting in the tests uh, of those uh, great individuals who are tested uh, in the book of James, uh, Job and Abraham. What is the test of Job? The test of Job, it's, it's quite interesting um, where it brings him, okay? The book is framed um, by Job praying and Job praying uh, and Job suffering um, like an animal, okay? And there's a transformation in Job's prayer from the beginning of the book to the end, okay? There's a transformation uh, in his ministry of intercession in which he is rendered uh, like a, a Christ figure uh, whose intercession um, is efficacious for his friends. He's given the mission uh, at the end of the book to pray uh, for all of those who told him uh, that he was in sin uh, in the midst of all of this, okay? And we're told that Job's prayers are heard, okay? Job's uh, prayers are perfected on the other end uh, of this test. Uh, the tradition about Job uh, actually gives us um, a text called the Testament of Job in which the test of Job changes. The test of Job, uh, in fact, comes uh, in the form of a poor man. A poor man comes to Job, okay, and he is tested to show charity. Will he offer him alms? This is the test. And in fact, um, the, the rabbis um, came up with ways to avoid, to make sure that you didn't see um, uh, the, uh, the, the poor man, uh, lest you fail the test. Okay, every time that you confront uh, the, 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 the poor man, you'll be confronted uh, with the, the test to manifest charity in your life. Uh, this, in fact, is uh, what's at work in the second chapter of James when we move uh, into this test of the assembly. If a poor man comes into your midst uh, clothed in rags, okay, uh, the poor man in our midst is the test of our charity, okay, which is the test uh, of uh, our wisdom uh, and our prayer. Uh, prayer is a test that we are equipped to win, just as Solomon uh, was equipped to win. You do not know how to pray as you ought, says St. Paul, um, which is actually very, very good news. Okay, you don't know how to do this at all, but the Spirit himself makes intercession Okay, with unutterable groanings. The Spirit prays for us, just as Solomon is put to the test and is given the wisdom to respond, so we are given the Spirit to pray. Jesus himself uh, invites us to pray for anything in his name, and then he gives us another advocate. He gives us the Spirit uh, who will intercede within us. The Spirit himself uh, makes this intercession. And uh, we are told by St. James uh, that we must ask without doubting, okay? So St. James, in, um, in the beginning of his letter here, he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. These trials are for our benefit. Uh, for you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance be perfect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives all generously and ungrudgingly, and he will be given it. But he should ask in faith, not doubting, 
For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, since he is a man of two minds, unstable in all his ways. Prayer is a test of our faith. Prayer is put to us as a test of our faith, to try our faith. Um, and the, the failure uh, has this shape. Um, you will be a man of two minds, a person of two souls, in fact. James coins a Greek word here that never appeared before, deep sukos. You have two souls within you. You have two masters within you. And you're blown like a wave of the sea. And he goes on to explain this, that these, these are the passions that move us. What is the thing that we ask for when uh, God gives us the ability to ask for anything whatsoever? Okay, are we blown uh, like the waves of the sea? The wind comes over us and we want now this, we want now this. Or do we want the one thing necessary? Do we want the one thing necessary? Seek first the kingdom of God. What is the one thing necessary? Jesus, the answer to every question in Sunday school. Yes, Jesus. The one thing necessary is always changing. The one thing necessary is what's necessary right now. What does God want from me right now? Where does God want to meet me right now? How does God want me to bring charity and wisdom into the world right now? This is the one thing necessary. And this is, this is the test of the one who has one soul, one desire, one prayer, one demand of God, one thing I've asked of the Lord, this alone I seek. This, this is the test uh, that's put to us, not to be blown uh, by the, uh, the winds of our passions, Okay, and by the confusion uh, of our passions, because our minds are confused by our passions, by these desires. We, we, we heard about ordered loves. Okay, I love too many things. Okay, I, I love all of my books. I, I, I love my 73 yellow Plymouth convertible, Hemi, okay. I, I love all of these things. Okay, the, the, the one thing necessary organizes, brings order uh, to all of these loves in my heart. Now, uh, the the test of our faith, which is given to us in prayer, isn't simply, I, want, I know you're going to give this to me so much, I, I, I'm confident that it's going to come. This is a dimension of faith um, that perfects our prayer. But the faith uh, that perfects our prayer is especially the faith of perseverance. Okay, so when Jesus teaches us to pray, what does he teach? Knock and it shall be answered. In fact, this is what James uh, has quoted. James has fused together uh, the prayer of Solomon with this teaching uh, of Jesus, knock and it shall be answered, okay? Ask and it shall be given to you. Um, knock and knock and knock like the persistent widow. So this, this is the test of faith. Not that I asked once and I was so certain that I'd get it and the, 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 the fairy godmother came and it came, okay? Uh, the, the test of faith is the testing, the trying, the probing of our desires. It's meant to purify our desires. So I start to pray, God, give me a new pontoon boat. Okay, that's, that's probably a bad prayer. Maybe it fits in the wisdom of God, but maybe it's just my desire. Okay, and then I start to say, God, give me a good family vacation. God, give me repose. God, help me to bring repose to my family. Slowly, slowly, as the pontoon boat doesn't come, if we're persevering in prayer, our prayer changes. Our request changes. Our desire changes. And as our desire changes, uh, we conform ourselves to the wisdom of God. And it's in this act of faith, it's in this act of perseverance, that the test of faith has been brought to perfection. Now, uh, I begin to pray uh, with the charity uh, and the wisdom of God. So, uh, the Father is the one uh, who disciplines us. Uh, the Father is the one uh, who invites us uh, to, uh, to undergo this test because the Father disciplines every child uh, whom he loves. The, the image of wisdom as a woman uh, is a, a very beautiful image, uh, but the wisdom uh, of uh, uh, wisdom, the image of wisdom as a father, um, brings a, a very different uh, kind of perspective. God is not God is paternal and not paternalistic. And where where do these tests all bring us? They they elevate us and bring us to this dignity, just like raising us to the table. Uh, paternalism uh, is the father who wants to keep his children infants who doesn't want to raise them, 
who's failed in the work of fatherhood and bringing them up to his level. And what God wants to do with us as a good father isn't uh, to keep us uh, forever infantilized. This would be paternalistic. He's paternal and he wants to raise us to his level. And this is why in this prayer of Solomon um, in uh, Wisdom 7, we are told that um, the gifts of wisdom, uh, the father has given the gift of wisdom uh, and the friendship through whom the gifts uh, of discipline commend them. Uh, the gifts that come through discipline render us friends, okay, equals with God. The wisdom of the philosopher, uh, who is Aristotle, said that it's impossible to be friends with God because it's impossible for there to be a friendship between non-equals if there's a hierarchy like this, okay? And we don't have a friendship um, in the same way between a little child and his parent, okay? But when the, the child has been raised and becomes one uh, level with his father, then there's a new dimension uh, of this relationship. And this is the fatherhood uh, of this, uh, this is the friendship uh, of this uh, paternal fatherhood that elevates us. This is the design uh, of the testing of God and the discipline of God, is to bring us uh, to the dignity of friendship. So um, the, uh, the, the trial of prayer uh, is a part of the trial of every Christian life, but it's a, a trial that the Father gives us, equipping us uh, to succeed uh, so that we can be his agents uh, of wisdom in the world, so that these gifts of wisdom can flow through us uh, and penetrate the world. So... There's no better way, uh, I suppose, to end than to pray with this magnificent prayer of Solomon and to ask with him uh, and on his behalf that wisdom might enter our hearts. God of my fathers, Lord of mercy, you who have made all things by your word and in your wisdom have established man to rule the creatures produced by you, to govern the world in holiness and justice and to render judgment in integrity of heart, Give me wisdom, the attendant at your throne, and reject me not from among your children. For I am your servant, the son of your handmaid, a man weak and short-lived and lacking in comprehension of judgment and of laws. Indeed, though one be perfect among the sons of men, if wisdom who comes from you be not with him, he shall be held in no esteem. Lord God, we pray that you would fill our hearts with wisdom. For with you is wisdom who knows your works. We pray that you would fill our minds with, your, with the light of your charity so that we might be agents of your peace in the world. Send her forth from your holy heavens and from your glorious throne dispatch her that she may be with us and work with us and that we may know what is your pleasure. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.